Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 3rd, 2013, and my guest is Emily Oster of the University of Chicago. She writes widely on development issues, women's issues, health, and she's also the author of Expecting Better, Why the Conventional Pregnancy Wisdom is Wrong and What You Really Need to Know. Emily, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. Our topic for today is your book, Expecting Better. It's a guide to what we know and don't know about pregnancy, but it's also an example of how to think about data and how to think about causation and correlation, a longstanding theme of this program. When you were expecting, when you became pregnant, you initially thought, you say in your book, that the doctor was going to give you this information and evidence about various phenomena that arise during pregnancy, the risks, the benefits, and you'd have to make decisions along with, as everybody has to do, and with under uncertainty. Uh, but that isn't the way it turned out. What was What surprised you? Yeah, I think the biggest surprise for me was I seemed to be unable to get the numbers and the data from my doctor. So there were very many times in which they would say, well, it's different for everybody or, well, the number's pretty small or, you know, we don't really know, but to be safe, blah, blah. And, you know, I think if for me, like the, the way that I think about decisions is I think, okay, I need to get the data. I need some numbers and then I will use that in conjunction with risks and benefits and some simple decision theory to make these choices and getting the actual like hard numbers was just very, very challenging. and wasn't something that was forthcoming from my doctor or from the standard pregnancy books that I started with. And why do you think that was? I'm not sure. So I think that, um, that, you know, one issue is that there is a lot of conflicting data often. So when I actually went into the data to find out the answers, as I'm sure we'll talk about, it wasn't that easy. So there was a lot of subtlety. And uh, I think that's one issue. And I think also um, because everyone is different in some sense, you need to explain to people, well, there's an average and here's what the average is. And I think that that's something that doctors are sometimes reluctant to do as opposed to just saying, I recommend X and that's what would work for most people. And I'm not sure that they're typically interacting with people who want, really want the numbers. Yeah, I, I think there, there are two other two ways to think about it. I think there are patients who don't want the numbers and there's doctors who don't want the numbers. I, I, they're not – neither. both groups are a little bit uncomfortable with uh, statistics and, and uncertainty in, in my experience. Yeah, I think that patients sometimes will just say, look, I just want you to tell me what to do. I don't want you to make – I don't want to have to make this choice. And I think that, that that in combination with sometimes doctors saying, look, I don't have – 45 minutes to go through all this with you. I'm just telling you, you should make this choice. I think those two things act in kind of a poor, uh, in a, in, they sort of interact poorly in a way that makes us not always make the best choices. And, you know, uh, like yesterday I was on the radio with a doctor who said, well, statistics is really hard. And so, you know, we don't think that we shouldn't really expect people to be making a lot of these decisions with data. And I think for me, it's like, are you kidding? Like you have to make these decisions As with data. That's what? The only, <laughs> right. What is your other system? Like what I only, this is the only system that we have, you know, there's no like secret other system. This is it. Well, so. We have folklore, superstition, um, right. some of which are, is true. Some of the folklore is true, obviously. Uh, but in for general, sure. uh, people data help. And I think, you make an interesting point there when you say when we talk about how people don't want the data themselves, then doctors, I think, sort of get in the habit of and enjoy telling people what to do as opposed to saying, well, you know, this is your call. You're going to have to think of it yourself. Yeah, and certainly not all. And so I think, you know, one of the things that um, that is definitely true is there is variation across uh, across doctors. And there's also this very clear set of constraints that I think doctors face, some of which have to do with just not having that much time and some of which have to do with legal sure. legal issues. And I think for, for both of those reasons, it is in some sense incumbent on women to think through these choices 
for themselves. And this extends past pregnancy into other parts of, oh, yes. of medicine that there just isn't really a choice. You have to do this to some extent by yourself. There isn't, there isn't another option. Oh, when you said there isn't a choice, I thought you also managed, you often mentioned in the book that sometimes it's just presumed you're going to do X just because, quote, oh, everybody does that. And that isn't really true. Yeah, exactly. Uh, did you ever find yourself saying, as I often do to, to members of the medical establishment, somewhat apologetically, well, I'm, I'm an economist, <laughs> to try to explain why you weren't like everybody else? Yeah, sometimes. I think it was more um, – Sometimes. I don't think I, I invoke that very often, but I did actually, my husband is also an economist and I, I occasionally was afraid he would be like too much like an economist. And I was like, we, he would come with me and I'd say, look, you just don't talk. Like, I don't, this person is going to be delivering our child. Like maybe you just don't say anything. Um, you know, we'll make this choice for ourselves and, and I'll get the data and we'll make the choice, but I don't think we need to like get into a big uh, hullabaloo with these, with this person. So I think that's, that just certainly came up. Yeah, for sure. Did out of curiosity, did you know you were going to write this book early on, later? When when did you come to the decision to write a book? Um, so certainly not at the, at the beginning. And I think you know there were a few things about the pregnancy that I think I anticipated I would be thinking a lot about, like prenatal testing. I kind of knew that I would want to spend some time understanding the the options. Because I thought it was it was complicated, I wasn't sure we would want to make the standard choice. I was surprised with the number of things that I ended up spending a lot of time researching. And the book kind of, if my idea about writing the book sort of evolved slowly, and at some point I was like playing around, oh, I'll write some, you know, I'll write a chapter on alcohol and see if I like that, and I see if I I enjoy it, and if I feel like it's it's a useful thing. And then in the end, you know, I liked it and. So did a publisher. And so that was where the book came from. But I certainly didn't think, OK, I'm going to get pregnant and then there's going to be a book. Yeah, I, you, you first thought you were going to write a pamphlet and then it turned out. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Exactly. So so what's hard about this? Let's talk about the general challenge of making decisions in these kind of environments. And as you point out, it's not just about pregnancy. It's almost all kinds of medical procedures. We're confronted with decisions uh, about testing and and the side effects of testing versus the benefits, the knowledge, false positive, false negatives. What makes it difficult uh, in general, and in particular with pregnancy, to establish what's what's a good idea uh, for, for a pregnant uh, person, to a pregnant woman to to do? So I think the, the the first very big issue is in a lot of the in a lot of what I research in pregnancy. There there is a very clear problem with causality, and it's it's in some ways almost insurmountable. So I think caffeine is really the best example of this. So the concern with having too much caffeine in pregnancy is that you might have a miscarriage. Okay, so it's most of the issues involve what about you know too much caffeine early in the pregnancy. And so the way that this is studied early in pregnancy is you, you look at women um, who drank some coffee early in pregnancy, you ask them how much coffee they had, and you look at their rate of miscarriage and you compare them to women who didn't have coffee and you look across different amounts of coffee. And so what, what do you find when you do that on that just rock so what you find, Yeah, so what you find is basically all of the studies suggest that up to 200 milligrams, which is about two eight ounce cups is fine. So you really don't see any increased risk of miscarriage up to that level. When you start looking at like eight cups of coffee, you see a f most much of the evidence does suggest that there's, uh, there's an increased risk of miscarriage. When you look in the middle, like three, four cups a day, uh, the evidence is, is a little bit mixed. Um, so it's one of those things where it's a little, like it's clear a little bit is okay. It's probably the case that a lot is a problem, but in this, in this intermediate stage, it's, it's unclear. And part of the issue is that when you look at these studies, the kind of women who drink coffee are just different than the kind of women who don't. And this is a problem in any observational study like this. Uh, and they're different in ways that are also themselves linked to miscarriage. So women who drink coffee tend to be older. Um, they tend to age is like the biggest issue. They that's the biggest issue with this. Like the age is linked to miscarriage and it's also linked to caffeine consumption. And so you can control for that, but you worry that there's other things like that that are still going on. In addition, in the case of coffee, and this was in some sense the most interesting thing for me research-wise, 
there is also a problem with nausea. So if you are nauseous in early pregnancy, it's a very good sign uh, about the health of the pregnancy. So women who are nauseous, um, like good news, ladies, uh, if you're nauseous, uh, you are less likely to miscarry. But women who are nauseous are also more likely to avoid coffee. So when you look at women and you see some of them, you know, drink a lot of coffee, those women are also on average women who are less nauseous. And when you see that they then miscarry at higher rates, it may well be just that not being nauseous is a sign of miscarriage and cause them to avoid coffee, but, uh, or cause them to drink coffee rather, but it's not that the coffee caused the miscarriage. And I think that getting around that kind of challenge is, is very complicated. This is what, um, is sometimes called spurious correlation. It's also what uh, my friend and uh, long ago econ talk guest Don Cox calls the dreaded third thing, the thing that, that you can't <laughs> measure or haven't measured that's actually the underlying causal variable. Exactly. And I, you know, and I think it's clear there that that is going to, it's clear the direction of the problem. So that particular issue is going to cause us to condemn caffeine too quickly. Uh, and so we can say, look, you know, the, we can see that there's no increased risk of miscarriage up to two cups. We should feel more confident about that because the, the biases push against finding that. But then when you ask, well, what about three or four cups? There's like one study which shows maybe that's a little risky and many studies which show it's not. And we want to then kind of combine our, our, the data with what we know about the problems with the studies and try to draw some Conclusion, I actually think that's a place where, you know, people may come to different, uh, different conclusions. And so some of what I'm sort of the kind of the point I'm pushing in the book a little is like, not everyone will make the same choices with the same data. And that's, that's okay. That's why you need the data is so you can make choices that work for you. But Emily, then you can't look down on people you think are doing the wrong thing. No, it's true. It's a big issue. Yeah. Uh, the judgy, the judging, you really ramp down the judging. I yeah. agree. Well, that's, that, that's one of the things I love about the book. And I think there's a subtle extra point about people being different, which is, of course, not only does everybody make their own decision, but everybody's tolerance for caffeine and desire for caffeine and the impact of caffeine is different as well. So this is true in, in pharmaceuticals generally. We're talking about caffeine, but in pharmaceuticals, the dose that's right for you isn't the dose that's right for somebody else. And we haven't learned enough about that to, to be sure yet of, of most of the time of what the right dose is for every, any one person. So exactly. th there's a lot of, uh, of uncertainty there. Uh, talk about in general, so the ty type of evidence you looked at. So one, what you just referred to is an observational study of a group of people. You ask them ret retrospective questions, which is also not ideal. These people forget, and they also might feel guilty that they drank a lot of coffee when they were pregnant. So if they've learned that that's not socially uh, acceptable, and they might lie or misremember unintentionally about their past behavior. But there are other forms of evidence that you're going to be looking at and that we're going to be talking about. So what are some of the other ways that we try to tease out the causation in these, in these examples? Yeah, so, so in the, there are actually a number of areas of pregnancy where, uh, where we have randomized data. And so that's, that's much better. So a randomized study in this setting would say we have a group of pregnant women and we do one thing to some of them and one thing to another. Uh, this comes up much more commonly when we think about things around birth. So if you ask a question like, uh, like, are there any risks to the epidural? We actually have like randomized data in which some women were uh, kind of encouraged to have an epidural and some women were like encouraged not to. Uh, and we can see, you know, we can compare their outcomes and see, um, and, you know, see what is different about them. And there you can be more, uh, you can be more confident that the effect that we are finding is, is causal. Um, and so I think that that was kind of, when those were available, that was nice. Now those studies are also not without their, uh, not without their downsides. They're run typically in a, you know, in a one population, not in all populations. Um, and Sometimes the outcomes are not all the things that you would like, but it, that was a, it was easier to learn things when there were studies like that, and that, um, that was nice. And as you point out, a lot of – sometimes there were random, randomized trials, which is nice, but they were a long time ago, sometimes just because they were done a long time ago, sometimes because you couldn't ethically get away with it now. It's not considered acceptable practice to shove uh, caffeine down a, a group of pregnant women randomly right. and another group not get it. And so – but – 
in those old times, those days from long ago, things have changed. Technology is different. We have different ways of coping with various things. So they're not always not they're not always so informative. No, I agree. And there's also an, an issue, which is that even when something is is significant in these randomized trials, you still want to ask the question, is this important in terms of size? Right. So when we looked at the epidural, one thing people are always saying is like, oh, if you have an epidural, it will really lengthen the it will really lengthen your labor. An and epidural, that's a really big an epidural being sorry, a, a, an epidural uh, yeah. being a painkiller, uh, pain reducing technique during labor. Yes, it's the most commonly used pain relieving pain relieving technique in the in the U.S. Um, and so the concern is it makes the the process of laboring of of delivering longer. And it's it's actually true that that it does on average in randomized trials, but the length of time is about 15 minutes. And so it is important there to know not only that this matters, but also how much, because whether you think this is a big problem or not, it really, I think is going to vary with, you know, is it 15 minutes or is it six hours? Like if you totally look, you get the epidural and you're going to be in labor for an additional day, that may sway people more than if you tell them, look, it's going to be another 10 minutes, but by the way, it's not going to hurt. So you're really not going to care that much. And so I think that, you know, that kind of thinking about the magnitudes as well as the significance is something that, um, that I think we often forget. Yeah, we forget that in public policy generally. I think that's an incredibly important yeah. point. Uh, uh, and Nassim Taleb recently in a podcast was talking about how well people predict. And the fact that people are right most of the time is no comfort if when they're wrong, it leads to a, a, a disaster rather than a, a small unpleasantness. Right, exactly, exactly. So you confess in the book that you love caffeine. And so tell us what you did uh, based on the evidence. How did you uh, change, if at all, your caffeine consumption during your pregnancy? So I actually, uh, I did in the end cut down in the beginning, but not, not because I thought it was risky, but entirely for the confounding like secret third factor, which is that I was pretty sick. And so I like, I'm used to having, you know, now like I wake up at five 30 before my kid and I have like two cups of coffee before she's even awake. And in the, you know, when I was pregnant, it was like, like I could barely get like carbonated water down in the morning. And so I actually cut down a lot at the beginning, not on purpose, but then I, then I ramped it back up. So I would say I was probably having uh, three, at least three cups by the, by the end. Is there an issue of caffeine during uh, breastfeeding, by the way? So I actually, I will say the book stops at the delivery room. Um, in general, these, these diet things in breastfeeding, I think most people take in a, are, are a bit less, uh, a bit less crazy about. And so I think in general, caffeine is thought to be okay during breastfeeding. Some people say that their kids react oddly to it. Um, mine seem to like it fine, well, I guess. That's I, didn't, they, I didn't hear any complaints. I didn't hear any complaints. That's, so. be, that's because your daughter has a genetic predisposition to liking caffeine like you do. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. She, uh, she does frequently ask for some coffee, but so far I haven't, uh, I haven't given in. <laughs> so let's talk about the uh, more controversial case of alcohol. Most pregnant women, I think, believe and are told that they should have not a single uh, molecule during uh, pregnancy, and uh, it's uh, very dangerous. So talk about what the uh, dangers are and what you found when you looked at the literature. Okay, so the the big concern with alcohol, the, the concern with alcohol is that it can lead to birth defects. And in the most extreme version, there's something called fetal alcohol syndrome, which is typically has both like physical, has physical manifestations that you can, you can see. Uh, e even lower levels of, of alcohol consumption can lead to, there's a series of disorders, typically under the, they're called fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which uh, behavior problems, uh, lower IQ, and so on. Um, and so there's no question that those things are real and that excess, you know, uh, exposure to a lot of alcohol in pregnancy is, is dangerous. I think that's not, that's certainly not up for debate. And in fact, I think one thing that's probably less cited is like even a couple of episodes of binge drinking at the wrong time can be, you know, can be quite dangerous. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's one thing I say that in the book, that's true. I, I think for many women, the question that they're wondering about is not like, would it be okay to binge drink? Um, or even would it be okay to continue drinking at whatever like level I drink at now, but rather would it be okay to have a glass of wine three times a week with dinner? And, and there, 
the advice, although it's, you know, certainly the Surgeon General says absolutely not. When you look at surveys, something like 40 percent of obstetricians will say, well, some uh, some amount of alcohol is is OK. Um, and clearly a lot of women like myself included are getting that advice like yeah, a couple, you know, a couple glasses of a couple drinks a week is OK. Like, don't overdo it. And so I think in the face of that kind of disagreement and in the face of asking a question, which isn't really the same as can I binge drink? I wanted to look at the data on which studied women who drink in moderation. And so really there you want to look at women who kind of say never have more than one drink at a time and, you know, never have a binge drinking episode. And I looked at that. I tried to find data like that. And there is, there actually are like a number of large studies. They mostly come from Europe um, or Australia where drinking at this level in this sort of moderate way is just more common in pregnancy. Uh, when you look at those, the evidence shows that the children of women who drink in moderation perform as well, sometimes better on IQ tests, uh, in measures of behavior problems, uh, as children, you know, as compared to children whose mothers abstained. So taking from that evidence, I think what one would conclude is that there isn't any good evidence that drinking in moderation like that ha causes problems. So that's what I say. And what did you end up doing? Um, so I had the, you know, the occasional glass of wine, maybe a half a glass, three or four times a week. I mean, I took pretty seriously the idea that like moderation meant not, uh, you know, not a whole glass or not, you know, not 10 ounces. Um, but I did have the occasional glass of wine. Actually, my obstetrician said that that was that was OK, although in the end, you know, for me, the data part of this was was the most important part of the evidence. And that your um, I would call it level headed uh, assessment of the evidence has gotten a lot of people angry out in the um, yeah. out in the world. What's, yeah. What kind of reaction are, are you getting from that? Yeah, I guess there's like different levels of reaction. So one piece of reaction that I expected, I think, was doctors who said like very early on, I you know, somebody said, look, Yes, one drink is a day is fine, but I caution women against doing that because if they have one, then they'll have two or they'll have three and that's not good. So I agree that having two or three is not good. I'm like not that excited about the implication that that women are unable to like control themselves. You know, I mean, I, I think may, I'm sure that there are people in that category. There's no question. And I, you know, I think if you are in that category, you shouldn't start. I think there are a lot of women like me who, you know, if you said you can have a glass of wine, we'll just have one and understand what that means. So, I, you know, I think that's, I see that argument, but I'm not sure that I think it applies to everybody. Um, then there has been a lot of pushback from the, um, from groups who are associated with fetal alcohol syndrome, who I think feel either that it's just very important to say you can't have any because if you suggest that in moderation, it's okay, that people will overreact or they genuinely feel that, that they disagree with, with my interpretation of the evidence. Unfortunately, there hasn't, it has been difficult to really engage on the evidence, which is, um, has been in some ways frustrating, I guess. Um, but there you go. Well, they, of course they can counter if they did engage on the evidence, they could counter that, well, uh, women who drink moderately aren't like other – going back to our causation dreaded third mm -hmm. thing. Uh, women who drink moderately are not like other women. And as you point out, you, you and you know lots of people and maybe I do too who can control themselves. But for other people, they're not the ones – you know, they're not in the data. They've got other problems. They've got other uh, behavioral issues. They may have other educational issues. They may have – and those may correlate with with bad outcomes or good outcomes. And so you've got to be – very cautious when you interpret the data. That that would be, I guess, their their response if they were thoughtful about it. Yeah, I think that that's um, I think that's that is a a thoughtful response, although not typically the one that I'm getting. I mean, I think what I'd say is, you know, when you look, part of what's nice about these European studies is, on average, these women who drink in moderation look pretty similar to the women who abstain. You actually do see in those studies that women who drink in excess do have kids with worse outcomes, and so it's it's not that the studies underpowered to find an effect. It's so I think that's that's encouraging. And, you know, I think we can engage on this on these kind of issues. And I think that they're um, that they're important. I do think it's useful to separate the question of 
kind of, are there some people who struggle with alcohol to which the answer is yes. And many, in many cases, those women also have other issues, which, you know, society should be doing more, I think, to help, to help with. Um, I think we can separate that question from the question of, you know, are there women out there who can have an occasional glass of wine and stop there? Yes. And, you know, should we be telling them what the data says? I would argue yes. So I'm a big fan of, um, of zero uh, for reasons of self-control. I think it's often much more difficult to have a little bit of something. Uh, in my case, it's carbohydrates, not not wine. <laughs> but but so zero well, carbohydrates in wine. What? <laughs> There's carbohydrates in wine. Yeah, well, they're not very. It's not very large though. But I'm, I was thinking more of French fries. So I understand yeah. the virtue of going to zero. Personally, I don't like the infantilization of um, of the, our culture that says you're not mature enough to handle this. Even of course, it might not. It might be true. You may not be mature enough to handle it. But I don't like the idea of somebody deciding for me that I'm not mature enough to handle it. So I understand the virtue of of this idea, even though I don't like the paternalism of it of saying zero. I like saying it for myself. What I'm curious about, though, is that for the binge drinking or the, let's say, larger amounts of alcohol than a few glasses of wine a week, to go back to your earlier point, you're saying the studies find that those aren't good. It's bad. I'm curious how bad. Do we have much evidence for how damaging uh, excess large amounts of alcohol consumption are for, for the child? Yeah, we do. And it's very bad. I mean, I think it it varies across people. So actually – some people can drink to excess and have kids who turn out fine. Um, and, but certainly that's not true for, uh, for everyone. And there's a tremendous amount of data that, um, that suggests that, you know, drinking to excess is a problem. This is a major cause of birth defects in the U S. So I don't think, I think it's not useful to, to like under, um, to un, underweight that. I mean, I think that that is a very significant issue. And I think probably again, like this, and in some ways, more relevant thing to say is this can occur with even a few episodes. And so a lot of, in many cases, people will say, look, you know, I, yes, before I knew I was pregnant, like four times I had six glasses of wine, but then as soon as I learned I was pregnant at, you know, seven weeks, I stopped, that may be too late. And so I think helping people figure out that they're pregnant earlier, helping people, you know, curb drinking while they're trying to conceive, like these are all, you know, relevant things to, to think about because the, the damage is so bad. It's just, I just feel like it's a different question than the question about moderation. So when you were pregnant and you were publicly maybe drinking a glass of wine, and as I think you point out in the book, and it certainly happened with my wife, when my wife was showing, people wouldn't even offer her anything because they just, either because they thought it was immoral uh, or they just assumed my wife wouldn't accept it. Uh, but you must have encountered people who said, well, come on, better safe than sorry. Kind of surprisingly, I never did. Now, part of that is I, I think I've only maybe once or twice had had a drink in public because I think I had exactly this, like, I don't really need to get into it with people. Yeah. I did once order a glass of wine and the waitress was like, good for you. My mom had an occasional glass of wine with me and I turned out fine. I was like, okay. One you know, it's nice to hear that. That's exactly <laughs> like, I'm not exactly compelled by that, but at least I'm, it's better, better than you telling me, you know, you're the worst person ever. So I was like, yeah. all right, thanks. One, Enjoy that. Well, one thing I don't think you mentioned, and I always use this when I talk to people about these kind of issues is that it, it's nice to keep the mom relaxed. It, it's not a trivial factor and and it's I think correlated with the health of the baby that you don't want to be stressed out during your pregnancy. So yeah. if you're uneasy for whatever reason because you've read too many studies about it, the damage from alcohol, <laughs> having a drink uh, uh. cools you off. It's you know it calms you down. Yeah, and I th you know I think that is a very real thing. I think of course the other side would say, well, you should exercise or you should like find, do yoga or something else to calm you down. And, you know, maybe that maybe maybe people should. But I, I agree that there is a there is a stress relief aspect to this kind of like routine, which, you know, for some people could in principle be, you know, be helpful. Yeah, you we do know that stress is bad. Yeah, you try uh, yoga with a 10 pound basketball around you. A oh, medicine yeah, ball. I have. I have. <laughs> and it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> now, smoking was an area you didn't find anything that went against the standard receive wisdom. Yeah. And this was an interesting this was an interesting thing to explain explore for me because I sort of did it. Okay. Like ca caffeine, alcohol, and then I come to smoking and, and you do see evidence 
exactly of the same form as you see in the alcohol case where it, same form in the sense that it's women who smoke compared to women who don't. You see a tremendous number of additional pregnancy complications among smokers. You see that they are, there's a lot of additional placenta problems. They're more likely to have babies with low birth weight. They're more likely to have their babies too early. Um, so those are all kind of issues that come up. But then you ask the same question that one asks in alcohol or caffeine, like, well, isn't it the case that the women who smoke are different from women who, who don't? And maybe it's just these other differences that are that are driving this. What was very helpful in the smoking case is we actually do have some randomized evidence. And you may think like, uh, like, how do you ethically get people to smoke? And the answer is you don't. But because we uh, generally think smoking is really bad, there are studies which encourage women to quit. Uh, and so we have randomized studies in which some pregnant women are put into a program to try to encourage them to quit. Sometimes those are effective. When they are effective, we can look at what happens to their babies and we see very large impacts, particularly on birth weight. So it looks like quitting smoking actually really improves the birth weight of your of your child. And so, you know, as a result, I, I think it's it's pretty clear that that's that's a goal that we should have. And birth weights, higher birth weights, generally a good thing. Yes, higher birth weight is generally a good thing. I don't know why that is, by the way. I'm I'm, I'm interested in that because there's always the issue that if you have lower birth weight because you, you're a smoker, it may not be as bad as if you naturally would have lower birth rate or lower birth weight. So what, do you know, I'm, this is, I don't, you don't talk about this in the book, but why is birth, rate, birth weight is correlated with many, many positive things? Why? Is it just a sign of health? Do we know? I think we think it's just a sign of health. I mean, there's a question uh, of there's there's sort of we draw this distinction about very like very low birth weight versus medium um, medium birth weight. I think within the range of normal birth weight, like above twenty five hundred grams, um, which is kind of the normal birth weight cutoff. You know, it doesn't actually matter too much where your where your kid is. Uh, very low birth weights are associated with additional problems, typically very early on, partly because they are also associated with being born very early, um, which is something smoking puts you at risk for. And so, uh, and that can mean that lungs are undeveloped and so on. So I think basically this is a marker for the timing. It's a more precise marker for the timing of birth or a marker for the fact that you weren't getting enough, the baby wasn't getting enough nutrition in the, um, in the womb. So certainly there are, there are ranges of healthy birth weights, which include quite low. Some babies are like great born at five pounds. Um, but it's, it's correlated, I think, because it's a marker for these other things. Now you mentioned a number of foods. Uh, and of course my wife was also told not to eat various things during her pregnancy. Um, what makes that list? Why do they make that list? And what do you think belongs on the list and maybe what doesn't? Yeah. So for me, this was like one of the most confusing things because the list was very, very long and it contained a lot of random things that seemed quite random. And so, you know, it's like there's deli meats. So at some point I went in and I said, is prosciutto a deli meat? My doctor was like, definitely not. I was like, all right, well, she sort of thought, seemed to think that was like a crazy question. And I thought, well, it goes in a sandwich. Like, what is the other definition of a deli meat? You know, I buy it at the deli counter. So I think that, that, from there, I came to think, okay, I really need to understand like why all of these things are restricted so I can sort of categorize uh, these are restricted for this reason and these are restricted for this reason and then I can think about whether those are risky, whether those are actually you know concerns. So some of the foods that you see like raw eggs the or sushi, the concern is with salmonella, which is a, you know, I think we're all familiar with, it can give you a, a stomach flu. It, it turns out that actually those risks are no worse in pregnancy than they are outside of pregnancy. So it's not the case if you get a stomach flu from salmonella in pregnancy that it's particularly dangerous to the baby. Just so no you fun. should be, you know, it's unpleasant. I mean, it's unpleasant when you're not pregnant. It's unpleasant when you're pregnant. There's no question. But there isn't any like excess reason to avoid some of those things in pregnancy. And so, you know, I, su I would say sushi, reputable sushi, like not a problem. Uh, then there are some things which are linked particularly to listeria, uh, which is a very, which are very dangerous. So listeria is a very dangerous foodborne illness. Uh, it 
particularly is dangerous for pregnant women. Pregnant women are more likely to get it than the average population, and it can cause miscarriage or stillbirth. Um, so it's a, it's a very bad thing to have. Uh, and it is the reason for the restrictions on soft cheeses, on like pate, on deli meats. But I realized that the question I needed to ask was not, is listeria bad, which it definitely, definitely is. Uh, but how much can I change my risk of getting listeria by avoiding these foods? All right. So the story is very different. So that I think that's that's where I came to to like I wanted to structure the decision. And so okay, let me go see what the last big outbreaks of listeria are due to. And the answer was cantaloupe. Okay? The answer when I was pregnant was cantaloupe. That was the thing that was the big risk for listeria. It appears nowhere on the like restricted list. Uh, and This is because, in fact, it is very, very hard to predict where listeria will come from. It is unfortunately uh, just often quite random. So there was a big outbreak in cantaloupe. There's been a recent outbreak in celery. Um, You know, we don't know where the next thing will come from. And so with a couple of exceptions, uh, like raw milk, soft cheese and deli turkey, I basically decided that it, it was avoiding these many of the things on this list we're not going to actually change my risk of getting listeria at least, or not change, change it only a tiny fraction. And so I, I then was faced with the question, okay, I would like a ham sandwich. And you know, when there is a possible, like a remote possibility that it might have listeria, I need to weigh those, those trade-offs. And I think that, you know, from there, it, it at least made it easier to make that decision. When I mentioned to my wife, <clears throat> the deli meat, um, worry. She said, oh, sure, nitrates. But you don't mention nitrates. It's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, there is some discussion of nitrates. It's not quite the same as foodborne illnesses. It's also the case that if you want to generally avoid nitrates, uh, you can typically get meats which do not have those. Um, so that felt to me like a less, we don't know that much about that. Yeah, uh, that's my feeling too. Uh, what about cats? That's the animal. Uh, not eating them. Uh, <clears throat> Right. But but being around them and changing the litter box, which uh, we we have had cats in our family, but not during our, our pregnancies. Uh, what's the issue with cats? So the concern is that there's a there's a parasite called toxoplasmosis, which um, which if you become infected with it during pregnancy can result in birth defects. Um, and cats are a, like a common vector of this parasite. Uh, so particularly when they are young, uh, if they are living outside and eating a lot of raw meat, this is something that cats can be infected with. Um, in practice, if you look at like what is the cause of most toxoplasmosis infections, it is not cats. In fact, it is very uncommon to get it from a cat, um, partly because most people's cats do not live outside, uh, partly because many people are already have been exposed to toxoplasmosis if they have a cat. And once you've been exposed, it's not um, it's not a problem. And so in the end, like this restriction on cleaning the litter box is not particularly well supported by the data, something which many pregnant women have like told me they wish that I hadn't said. Of course. Of, yeah, get out of the yeah, litter I box. Mean, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. But well, I was the litter oh, well, box. You got to You got to. Yeah. No, I mean, you can still make your spouse do it. I think yeah, that's, sure. that's the message. No, that's but it seems message. to me the, the message. And by the way, that this. It's clearly a scurrilous uh, campaign against cats from the dog lobby, and we should we should try to get a cat spokes animal on here for equal time. But it seems to me one of the lessons of this is that you should get a cat early in your marriage before you're pregnant, so you can get exposed to it, and then the other forms that would expose you to it won't won't affect you. Seems like cats, yes. you know, we should. Uh, I don't know. Um, I was going to say any. Let's say I was going to ask about. Um, Gardening, and then we'll, we'll, we're going to move on. But how about gardening? Why would gardening be an issue for pregnant women? So it's actually for the same reason as the cats, um, although in this one, this is a real thing. So, so it turns out one thing that is linked with toxoplasmosis infection is doing a lot of outdoor gardening, probably because cats, other cats, not yours, but cats that live outside may poop in your garden. And, uh, and then when you're gardening, it like stirs up the, the poop. Um, and so if you are going to do a lot of outdoor gardening, I think the advice of like wearing a mask or wearing gloves is not, uh, although it seems a little crazy, is, is not actually crazy. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's let's move away. So this is um, one last thing about about uh, pregnancy in your book, which um, fascinates me. I read an article when I was doing my background reading for this interview that it was an angry screed, and I'm, you may have seen it, uh, suggesting that your book was awful because you're unqualified. You're you're the wrong kind of doctor. You're you're a PhD in economics. You don't know anything about medicine, and it's irresponsible for you to go around making health recommendations. Um, and people should ignore your book. What's your response to that? Um, yeah, I'm surprised you just found one like that. I, oh, you know, I stopped I think looking is after a, that, Emily. That's right. I, I thought one was um, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> one is enough. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that that if you read the book, it's very clear this is a book about data. And this is a book about looking at data and evaluating causality and thinking about, you know, what's a good study, what's not a good study. That is exactly what my training is in. You know, I am a health economist. I have a lot of training in statistics. I think all the time about what's causal, what's not causal. Uh, and so I think in, in many ways, my training is better than, than a doctor's training for evaluating these kind of questions. The book is not going to deliver your baby for you. And so I think there's no question that this is this kind of thing that women will read in conjunction with also, you know, going to their, going to their doctor, I assume. Uh, and I, so I, I think it really is complimentary, but I also think there's a very clear reason why someone who has a lot of training in statistics would be the person who writes a book, which is all about data. So I think that's kind of the, I, I think if people actually read the book, uh, they will see very clearly why someone with my training will come at it at this, you know, in this angle. Uh, have there been a lot of, of of criticism? Have you received a lot of criticism along those lines, sort of um, uh, the circling of the medical wagons? You know, not as much as I as I thought. So actually, like I, I think a lot of uh, doctors recognize that these are the way that their patients should you know should be thinking about this stuff, and uh, and in part because there is absolutely no way that that a doctor is going to be able to convey all of the information that someone needs in their pregnancy during their visits. There's a sense in which you have to rely on the patient reading something else. It is probably better for them to read something which at least met, discusses the studies rather than like just reading the internet. So, um, so I've gotten, you know, actually some pretty nice feedback uh, from doctors. Yes. I would, uh, not only do I believe that your training is particularly well suited to the questions that you deal with, so I, I, I second your defense, but I would also say that doctors are particularly ill-suited for these kind of issues. Uh, they don't typically, I think it's changing, but they don't typically get trained in data analysis. They're certainly not trained in statistics or decision making. They don't have a very good appreciation of uncertainty. And they're prone to say things, as as a friend of mine did when heard when he he's a, he was a motorcycle rider. He broke his leg, and um, the doctor put his leg in a cast, and then said, "Well, I hope you learned your lesson." And my friend said, "Yeah, well, as soon as I get off my cast off, I'm going to ride my bike again." And the doctor was mystified. The doctor couldn't understand the idea that there might be a trade off. That life is dangerous. Right. Some things are dangerous. Sometimes it's worth it, even though it's dangerous. It's this idea that economists have that there's a continuum of risk rather than safe, unsafe. And if you look at the at the pregnancy books and the guides and all the things that you're, I think, reacting to, it's that, you know, people, of course, want to know, is it safe? And the answer is no. And it's not unsafe. It's right. complicated. And people don't like that. And yeah. doctors aren't trained to think other than that. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's like, there's a some of what I, I get and you, like I get on the radio with doctors, you get like, I just really care about the health of the baby. It's like, well, I really care about the health of the baby too. No kidding. Um, <laughs> but I think we should also be making decisions which like are correct. We shouldn't just not be doing things because we enjoy them. You know, we should understand. And, and by the way, like, do you ever allow your patients to take a non-essential car trip? Because that is very dangerous. Do you right, let your exactly. patients so, go skiing? <laughs> right. I mean, even if they don't let them go skiing, for getting in your car is like the worst. You know, your car is – so I think in some sense we have to recognize that, you know, by not all living on a rural farm in Finland away from all, you know, motor vehicle transportation and only breathing healthy Finnish air – we are all putting our babies at risk, unfortunately, and you just, you know, we have to recognize that and then make those choices correctly. But as you point out, 
and uh, it's important that we mention this. As we live in this risky, dangerous world full of nitrates and cats and alcohol and Starbucks and all the other things that that complicate our lives, pollution, our babies are safer than ever. Our mothers are safer yeah. than ever. Ever the um, the maternity the maternal mortality rate uh, is dwindling towards zero in developed countries and in and and the infant mortality rate is dwindling towards zero and the only reason it hasn't dwindled more is because we now count babies that are born I think I assume in the data that are born at very 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 early times with very very low birth rate that wouldn't have even been in the denominator um, 50 and 100 years ago yeah I think it's certainly worth yeah, worth noting that part of the reason that we can get so exercised about the question of like, is it appropriate to have three cups of coffee a day is because like, we are not getting exercised about questions like 50% of babies are dying because we do not have like, you know, good medical care for, for women. So I think that that is a very valuable point. And I wasn't going to bring it up, but I want to now because we've talked about it. Um, yeah. This, uh, there's a lot of, of romance and we thought about it for our children, but we didn't end up doing it. But there's a lot of romance about home birth. And one of the arguments for home birth is, well, people have been having births at home for millennia. Uh, so it's obviously the natural right way to do it. But as you point out, in, develop, in developing countries, in poor countries, even a primitive, primitive hospital is uh, better for the baby. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think the sort of end of that clause is women have been having babies at home for millions of years, but a lot of them died. Um, and so, I mean, I think yeah, I try actually, so there's a lot of like, you know, blah, blah, about home birth, like a lot of people on either side of this in the U S and I think it's worth saying it's a little bit of a different question to ask, like, is it dangerous to have your baby at home in Park Slope five minutes from a really, really nice hospital with a really well-certified person? That's a very different question than, you know, is it safe to have your baby in a hut you know, is it safer to have your baby in a hut in rural, you know, Finland. in rural Kenya than in, in a, yeah, exactly. So in Finland. So I think, you know, I think try actually in the book to, to go, to do as, to do a more nuanced and balanced portrayal of this than I think sometimes we get in the media when you have like kind of the people on the home birth guys on one side and the non home birth guys on, on the other side. And I, you know, I wouldn't do it. And I think we have to recognize that having a home birth has additional risk relative to a hospital birth. I think to not recognize that seems, um, seems you know silly to me although i think in fact like done correctly it may be that those risks are relatively small and offset potentially for some people by exactly a hundred other things that are nice about home yeah i mean i have friends who have had their babies at home who said like this was great and i understood that there was some risk but for me it, you know there was a really big benefit and i think you know i think that acknowledging that people may have different preferences which you know, take into account those risks and benefits, I think is very, very important. Yeah. One of the advantages of the home birth, by the way, is the avoiding of, of many of the things that you talk about in the book where things were um, done to you or given to you. And I think this is true for every pregnant woman uh, that you might not have been so crazy about. Uh, and sometimes it's just there's pressure to do these things, whether it's a fetal monitor, an epidural. And I think you said the same thing I've heard so many times where I was uh, – we were fortunate enough to have – I'm fortunate enough to have a wife, I think. I was fortunate enough to have a wife who had four natural childbirths, didn't have an epidural. I think that's a good thing, okay? So, you know, obviously it's complicated. I could be wrong. But there are so many times where people said, oh, you'll have one, you know, with this smug, oh, you'll have one. And a lot of times yeah. the staff gets mad that you don't have one because they don't want to listen to you yelling or whatever it is. They don't want to deal with the complications. And so much of – I think too much of modern medical practice is – I'm doing this because, look, I've got to, I got to get it out here quickly. So I'm going to give you Pitocin. I'm going to give you, I'm going to speed your birth along. I'm going to induce you tonight because I've got a golf game. I've got a, a trip to take. I've got, et cetera. And it's like, why aren't I in charge of this? And I think there's a terrible problem and I, it's not going to get better for a while, if ever, that the customer is in charge. Yeah. And I think it's not hard the to advocate. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's hard to advocate for yourself in that situation. I think one of the things that we, you know, that we worked, I also didn't have an epidural and I, you know, but I met most of my friends didn't think I'm a weirdo. Um, so I think there are some real benefits to the epidural clearly, but I think that there's, um, you know, that's just, it's, this is a situation in which it's hard to advocate for yourself because the power dynamic is very, um, is, you know, very skewed. 
And it's very hard if someone is telling you, you know, look, you have to have a C-section because it's otherwise it's dangerous for the baby. It, it, like most people, it's very hard to be like, well, actually, like, are you just overreacting to this, you know, this piece of information? And I, I almost nobody is going to push back like that. Yeah. And I think that that generates now what actually sort of related to this, there's a very interesting paper uh, by Aaron Johnson uh, at MIT, which actually looks at C-sections among doctors. And she sees it in for among doctors in California, they're far less likely the doctors giving them who themselves are giving birth are far less likely to have emergency C-sections, which like one and certainly one interpretation of that is that in some other situations, you know, doctors are overreacting and doing C-sections when they're not necessary. And when it's a doctor as a patient, they're better able to push back. So I think that's kind of an interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. Related yeah. fact. Or it could be, of course, that. Doctors just are less prone to C-sections, but that'd be a tough argument to push. Yeah. Um, it seems hard. I agree. Yeah, that, that would be difficult. I think that's a, another argument for having a doula, which if you can afford one, um, a doula being a person who helps out uh, during the pregnancy, during the delivery. And uh, it's really useful to have someone – this is m my small bit of advice for anybody out there who is expecting. Uh, it's very useful – to have someone in the room who's not you and isn't your husband uh, who can represent you in these kind of situations, who's seen more than one pregnancy, which more than one delivery, which you often on your first baby have not. So, you know, in our case, we had the same issue that you talked about. We had a, a fetal monitor put in at the at one point. It showed that the heart rate was dropping and our doctor hadn't arrived yet, and they decided to give my wife a C-section. Well, we really didn't want a C-section. We were really, but we weren't in a very clear emotional state. We didn't have a doula at that for that for our first child. And we were lucky. The doctor came shortly thereafter. Said, "Oh, oh, that's just because it was a contraction. Ignore it." But <laughs> to have, yeah, great, huh? Oh, we almost gave you a C-section for nothing. <laughs> but they were, they were, they were scared too. By the way, right? Of course, it's it's a yeah, scary thing. But if you've seen two hundred deliveries. You've seen that happen before, and you react very differently than if it's your first one. But the more important point I'm making is that. For my wife and for me, I mean, the emotional roller coaster that you're on at that point is not a easy place to make calm decisions. And you point out it's nice to have a list of things that you would like to have achieved during your delivery about what you will and will not do and at what point. And uh, a doula is a nice person to help you do that. And if you don't have a doula for whatever reason, just be prepared for that. You think, oh, what could – this is all straightforward. The doctor will do what's best. But what's best is very complicated. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I actually, there's some randomized, I would go even farther on the doula thing. I, I, you know, there's randomized evidence, even that women who are given a doula, like at, when they arrive at the hospital, who haven't just, just to have a, like a labor support person in the room, have fewer C-sections, have less use of an epidural. And so I think in some sense, that's, so that would be a cheap way for hospitals to like decrease their C-section rate, which is something I think most hospitals are trying to are trying to do. But I think certainly from the personal perspective, that was like, I think probably the best decision that we made uh, about, about labor and delivery was to have a doula. So let's, let's move on. Let's move away from pregnancy for the last few minutes. Uh, I want to talk about uh, your, some of your other work, not your pregnancy work. Uh, you wrote a very influential and much talked about paper on hepatitis B. And you were trying to explain why the sex ratio in uh, Asia was so dominated by males, why males were disproportionately represented. And talk about what you found in that paper and then what happened uh, with other types of evidence that came along. Sure. So um, so when I first wrote this paper in graduate school, I was – you know, I. I ha there was some data from from scientists basically suggesting that that uh, parents who were carriers of hepatitis B had uh, more male children, and I then put together a bunch of other sort of cross country, cross group data which supported that idea uh, that places or groups that were more had more hepatitis were had more boys, and I then took a next step and said, okay, you know, one of the, one thing that we've noticed in developing countries is that a lot of places like China and India have more boys. And they also, China in particular has a very high hepatitis B rate. And I kind of did a little calibration and said, you know, maybe as much as like, I think it was like 60% of this uh, differential might be because of this hepatitis B thing. 
Um, and as you might expect, that claim was very controversial. It also, ex post, turned out to be wrong. Um, so about, you know, about maybe a year after I had, had done this, um, some guys came along in, in Taiwan and actually had much, just like much better data, uh, which actually had whether the mother for a very large sample of women, like basically every birth in Taiwan for some period, they had whether the mother had hepatitis and what the gender of her kid was. And they showed there was basically no relationship. So then, you know, like all people for whom this happens, I thought, ah, you know, is there any way to salvage this? And, and the, the thing I was asking was whether maybe it's the, the parental, maybe it's the, the fathers, maybe the fact that the father has hepatitis is the, the thing that's actually driving this. That was so, clever. Well, you know, well, if one always wants to rescue one's work. So I actually yeah. went, um, went to China and ran, a, you know, I sort of went in conjunction with a bunch of doctors, did a really big survey in which we could see the, the hepatitis B of both the mother and the father and look at their kids. Um, and it turned out, you know, at some point the data came in and, and it turned out actually, no, there was no link between either maternal or paternal hepatitis and the uh, and the gender of the kids. So I, you know, wrote up a paper, which I think was titled like hepatitis B does not explain male bias sex ratios in, in China and basically said, you know, look, this, this earlier argument was based on this effectively circumstantial evidence. Um, we have better evidence now and it just doesn't seem to be what's, what's going on. So this puts you in a very small class of uh, academics who, who have the privilege of conceding that you were wrong and even better, publishing a paper showing it. I mean, that's really, it, it stuns me, really. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being facetious at all. Um, <laughs> how rare it is in our profession that someone, when, when a paper comes out that counters what the original paper found, that someone then concedes that they were actually wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a, some, relative to some of these other like very longstanding, just like back and forth in economics about this stuff. There was a, a sense here in which it, it wasn't, it wasn't really that what I had done earlier was wrong. Um, I mean, it, the conclusions were wrong, but like the analysis wasn't wrong. It was that, you know, this new data came out and I think it made it at least psychologically a little bit easier to, although not that it was like the greatest period of my fun, professional sure. life. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was like a little bit easier to kind of come back and say, okay, you know, like new data comes out and that's kind of how science works. And I think always in those situations, like you would like to be the bigger person, but it's like very, it's like very hard. Um, well, that's another but, that's another interesting experience you got to have. I'm sure. Uh, I mean, these things happen constantly in in economics. A paper comes out that makes a dramatic splash. People challenge it, and usually the people who get challenged they don't concede an inch. <laughs> they, they they in fact they just say, well, okay, yeah, that, that's true. But I'll rerun the regression. I'll include this now, and look, it still holds up. It's yeah. very no, hard. I think that's, yeah, no, it's hard. I mean, I think we're all kind of it, it's. Uh, it, we all want, you know, you get invested, even if you don't ex ante care about what the, what the answer was, like you, once you've written it, like you're invested and you, you know, and it feels really bad to mess up. And I think that that's, um, that was definitely something that I learned. <laughs> and, and it might actually, you might've actually established something that is actually true. I, I, let's close by having you, I'd like to hear your speculate, speculate about the, the state of economics and econometrics I'm a skeptic about our ability to tease out causation in, in many of these cases that we care about. Pregnancy is one example. Um, we have some information. We've learned something. The question is how much. And in public policy, where the causal mechanisms are often much more complex, we don't seem to make much progress. There are very few people concede they were wrong about the impact of the minimum wage, say, on employment when their study gets refuted, rejected, well, never gets refuted. A different study comes along and finds something else. So where do you think we stand? Do you think we're making progress? I think we're making progress. I mean, I think, you know, it's, I kind of see what you're, what you're saying. And I think there are some, you know, there are some fields in which kind of the idea of doing things randomly, doing, you know, randomized stuff has, has become more um, in vogue and that, you know, that has some downsides, but it does help with some of these uh, some of these causality issues, but I, you know, I do sometimes share your view that particularly on some of these big 
these big things, it kind of seems like we're never going to, there's going to be just continual uh, advances in methodology, which lead us to kind of slightly different, but not that different can, conclusions. And that it's very, because none of these things are, you know, definitely for sure causal, uh, it's going to be hard to ultimately draw, like, it's hard to feel like you ever are ultimately going to draw strong conclusions. But I, you know, I do feel like we, uh, as knowledge advances, we do, we do learn more, I hope. Yeah. Oh, I hope. My guest today has been Emily Oster of the University of Chicago. Her book is Expecting Better. Emily, thanks for being part of EconDoc. Thank you so much. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.